Uh, my name is Rudy. This will be my first day here. I believe it's an eight-week uh, program, and I'm just confused. I don't, I don't know what to expect. No, don't know anything about it. So I'm just happy to be here. Start. It's my first day at Pitzer College. My name is Benjamin Guillen. Um, kind of entering this blind because. I don't know what to expect out of this. My name is Jack Irving. My first day at uh, Pittsburgh College. I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited more for the program to see where I'm going to be in 10 weeks, what the future is going to hold for me. Uh, and I'm just trying to be a better man today than I was yesterday and, and, and live my life that way. Stole some phones and sold them. Blamed it on a recession, so they promptly gave me a sell. Reception, always at full bars, and court they read me a text. It had several sentences. Change don't come when you're up in a pen. Pen, pictures on the wall. My girl removed our pictures from the hall. I couldn't vote them in. A felony conviction. Now that I'm out again, I can't get a job again. What happened to my job placement? Truly, this nation needs rehabilitation. Okay, my name is Eileen, and I'm at the first day of the Reintegration Academy at Pitzer College. And um, I got interested in this program because when I first got out of prison, and the program I was in, the ladies were in the program already, and I was too, it was almost over by that time. But I showed an interest in it and was waiting for the next enrollment so that I could get involved in it. It looked really interesting to me. I can't wait to see what they're going to bring. It sounds exciting. And, well, I don't know. I'm just waiting to see what all I'm going to get out of it. I just love to get knowledge and whatnot, so. I heard, I heard a lot of good things about it. Eighty-five percent of the people that come here, they uh, they leave here with a, with a, a life uh, a, a, a life career, and, and most of them stay with it, stick to it, and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm coming from El Monte, originally I came out of L.A., mm -hmm. but when I got out, my, my parents are already leaving in El Monte, so that's where, I, that's where I'm staying at. Okay. And it's so hard to do anything. I don't even have a car. I should be getting my driver's license pretty soon, hopefully, on the 18th. So it's kind of hard to get around. Especially like today, my sister brought me over. It was like a 30 or 40, 44 minute drive or something like that. But I'm just getting adjusted to everything after, after 28 years and I have been incarcerated, so everything is way out, so different. I'm excited to be here. I'm looking forward to learning some new things and great opportunities that's put in for me. Uh, I'm just glad to be here and I appreciate the uh, chance to be chosen. I got first day here and my initial excitement is a little bit of anxiety, don't know what to expect. I've only been out of prison for exactly five weeks now, so everything's still new to me and fresh to me. Hi, my name is Nalita Cruz, and this is my first time here for a special event for the Reintegration uh, Academy with uh, Dr. Reese. Um, I am super happy to be here and excited to know more details about it. My name is Barbara Chavez. I have life without parole. I've 20 years for My name is Cornelius D. Gandhi. Um, I served 25 years on a 25 to life. My name is Gloria. I served 21 years, three months. My name is Nalita, and I served 17 years on a seven to life sentence. My name is Eileen, and I served 16 years on a life with the possibility parole sentence. My name is Cynthia Matthews. I did a 15 to life and did 33 years. First of all, I want to say uh, when you come in, let's make sure we take our hats off. Uh, if you have a hat, uh, I want to say welcome to uh, the Reintegration Academy. This is the seventh cohort. And uh, this is when your life changes. And it's not 
overnight, but it's incremental. You don't do anything by yourself. This is our network. When you put this on, this is our bag. This is our emblem. This is our symbol, right? Everybody knows when you wear this that we're separate as the five fingers, but we're one as a hand. And nobody breaks the band line. But Star, you can't be so idealistic that you sabotage yourself. Right? So you need the idealism saying that you can jump out there and you'll learn how to swim. Well, a miracle can happen. You need some of that inside of you. But then you need the realism to say, if I jump out there and try to save them, that's two people that are dead. So the key is to have the idealism on this side that you can do anything. But then have the realism on this side. Go out and get you a job, get you a foundation, work for somebody, get some expertise before you start your own business. Because so many people fail because they're all the way on this side and they have these grandiose expectations of what they want to do. They want to jump out, just jump out there and try to save that person, right? And so let's be, let's be idealistic, but at the same time, let's be realistic, okay? Do you have a job, yes or no? What is your job title? Do you have any educational goals? This could be associate degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, and so on. Go ahead and write down your educational goals. What is your greatest strength? It's your leadership. Is it communication? Are you a good listener? I had the mentality at the time like oh they can't tell me who I'm gonna love um, it's her dad you know but come to find out like yeah I ended up doing 10 months of that for that one um, so just really that last time coming to the point where and kind of preparing in my mind before I was even released like you know what whatever it is that they're saying I need to do even if it's not talking on the phone not being around people like whatever little thing it is just don't do it and kind of once I made that decision I didn't have any more problems they ended up just like releasing, I think I was on parole a couple more months and they ended up just discharging me. It was finding out like what to major in, what, what did I want to do. I find this not only with myself but also like the transfer applicants that I work with, that's like the number one thing that they're asking me as we fill out the application is like what should I major in. And um, I've really come to know like it's about following your passion. Because if you let like the counselors or other people kind of tell you what you should major in, guess what, your heart is probably not in it. And it, it's hard, it's not easy to get a good uh, four-year degree. It takes determination, so your heart needs to be in it. You want to be doing something that you're passionate about, so at the end of the day, you're going to finish. You're going to finish the class, you're going to finish the book, you're going to finish the schoolwork. But what really motivates me to be here, to volunteer, is you know, I don't get credit, we don't get paid, we don't want none of that. Um, one of the reasons we do it is because I've come from a community where my friends have died. I, the day I went to go defend my masters so they could say yes, I passed. Before I went, I went to the cemetery because I told my homie that was murdered that I would get my masters for him. Um, and that was a big step for me. So, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons that I'm here today is just seeing people being positive and wanting to do something, you know, change whatever that means to you just moving forward you know so I hope what we are learning here we can um, embrace it and um, just make it work for us and I, I want to congratulate each and every one of you for being here I've done 17 years on a life sentence and um, by God's grace I, I, I've been discharged uh, approximately a year ago so uh, I have a food ministry that I do uh, in the city of Pomona and Glendora and also a clothing ministry that we, we send close to the South Americas and Mexico. And um, so we are touching lives near, wide and far. But uh, all that I've got here, it helps me to do what I'm doing now. And so I, I, cannot, uh, uh, I pray that um, this is a beneficial class to you and that you'll make good use of it. All right? Thank you, sir. First of all, I'm assuming everybody's just coming home recently, right? Yeah. So I'm going to say welcome home. Uh, me, myself, I'm going to just echo what the pastor just said. Uh, I came, I've been home four and a half years now, and uh, I had an opportunity to come through this pro uh, program with my parole officer. What's up, bro? And uh, 
and it was a wonderful opportunity. I'm gonna tell you, uh, you get to network with a bunch of wonderful people, and and another thing is we get to network with each other because coming home, how many of you guys former lifers? Look at Jeff. <laughs> okay, so the, the most important thing I hear, I'm gonna tell you, is, is, is continue to network with that lifer uh, population that we was networking together in here to try to figure out what we need to do to go to the board to get found suitable to come home. We still network today. We network on, uh, you need car service. We network if you need a job. We network on if you need housing. You know, we still have this connection going on. Say is, uh, you know, uh, take advantage, man, of this second in women, of this second opportunity that um, you guys deserve and just make the most of it. You know, uh, just still be conscious. I, I'm just re echoing something that I know that y'all know already. Just be conscious of your decision making, you know, because uh, we still on parole. Uh, we still gonna be held accountable at a higher degree than anybody else. So uh, y'all already know what to do. Y'all made it this far. Okay, so my name is Gianna, and some of the ladies back here, they know me from CIW. I did 30, almost 33 years in prison. I was released in 2013. Uh, I was the first woman to come to the Reintegration Academy. Thank you, Dr. Reese, for opening that door for me, and now it's open for all the other women as well. Um, since I've been released, a lot has happened. I uh, did really well on parole for a couple of years and got into a domestic violence relationship, went back to prison for three years, got out, and I've been out now since uh, 2015. Um, I have a wonderful job. I am a certified counselor now. And I work at a treatment center that uh, houses, it's a uh, treatment center for men. And I just got my first apartment uh, with another lady that uh, finished um, one of the treatment facilities. So life is really good. Um, it can happen. Uh, if you put your, put your mind to change, if you put your mind to um, walking and wearing that freedom that you have today, the best thing that you can ever put on is freedom. You may put on your shoes and your socks and your clothes, but put freedom on first because that's number one. And that's what will get you through that day. And that's what will keep you motivated and keep you moving on in, into the rest of your life. Thank you. During the Reintegration Academy, as you know, we toured the, toured the colleges, Cal Poly Pomona, the Claremont Colleges. And during that time, we also had uh, professors here at uh, Pitzer College tell me about the, tell the class about the New Resource Scholarship, uh, scholarship um, which allows people of non-traditional age, non-traditional background to apply for a, a, basically a full ride scholarship to attend here at Pitzer College. Um, at the time, I was a, a student at Santa Monica Community College. Um, I had just got my associate's degree and I was coming to the Reintegration Academy and I was hopefully heading to, uh, to Cal Poly Pomona. Um, but once I found out about the scholarship here at Pitzer and the core values that Pitzer stands for, environmental sustainability, intercultural understanding, social justice, these issues uh, resonated with me. Right next to you, right? So get to know each other, talk to each other, give yourself a big round of applause. You know, there's always this whole, you're, you're grown up, you know, don't be, don't become a criminal, don't, you know, fall down these paths because you get like this preconceived notion that all criminals are the same, you know, cookie cutter, like they're just bad people. But in reality, that's not the truth at all, you know. We all are that one mistake from, you know, similar circumstances. And it's just really important to like understand when, you know, we're out here meeting you guys, I gotta meet Guillermo. Um, it's just, you know, sort of like that, that aspect of society that no one wants to talk about, you know. People don't bring attention to this, you know. It's like, they're criminals, it's what they've got in, that's sort of like the stigma. But, you know, that's not the case at all because at the end of the day, what these experiences, going to CIM, you know, being in front of all you guys, what it really teaches is that at the end of the day, we're all human beings. It's Trey Biel, and I, I always like to find um, how have you interviewing us has it changed your perspective on prison and prisoners? And meeting Jack and him telling me his story of how you know he would read, he would do all these things to try to like keep his mind sharp. And he got out. He has his wife. He has his daughter. You know, this is paradise to him. He doesn't. He's not looking for the hereafter. He's looking for 
you know, he's, he's trying to work for his kid, make sure they're better life, his wife, and it's kind of just like, all these experiences, you're humanizing yourselves to me, in a, in a sense. And I believe that's what's needed in society because a lot of people have that, that social constructive belief is like, you're not part of us. You're something different, you're not fit for us. But in reality, that's not the truth. And so that's kind of what interviewing you guys and talking to you guys and meeting you guys personally has really done for me. Um, I was wondering, after I hearing- You're the only person I know can film and talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what you call talent. <laughs> this is my profession. So, I was wondering after hearing several of you speak, um, first and foremost, it was very uh, moving. I liked hearing what you guys had to say. And I believe that each and every one of you were speaking from the depth of your heart, correct? And it was all true, correct? So, how would you feel if I told you that some of you would be denied and have to stay in prison longer for speaking your truth because of a word when you said honestly that would cost you three to five more years in prison I feel like there was a uh, there was a system that was working behind um, behind the uh, behind the curtains that uh, wanted me to stay longer and he was talking about kind of being in, in class and and feeling as though people are, are always looking at you or feeling as though you don't really fit in there. Uh, and that resonated just because there, there aren't many black political science students at our school and there's rarely more than three of us in a classroom. So when I sit there, it's like when I answer a question, suddenly I'm the poster child for black men of America or, or I, gotta, I gotta put on for like the race. Like I gotta make sure I sound eloquent. I gotta make sure everything's good and I have those thoughts running through my head constantly, constant anxiety of like wanting to prove that I deserve to be in those spaces. Uh, and so I thought that was kind of, I thought it was interesting that we come from completely different backgrounds and we still kind of have that that same haunting feeling of, about being in, in classroom settings or just going throughout life. We do feel like we have to solidify ourselves where we are and make sure people understand that we do belong and we do belong here, you know, like we belong here. And I know that you guys are fighting for that as well. The fact that you guys, like you guys belong here in society. And talking with Tyrese, it was just so amazing to have a conversation with him and how philosophical he was and how open-minded he was. And I just, this program is, is, is very, very, um, very important because you guys deserve a chance to establish yourself in society and I think that this is the perfect program for you guys to integrate properly in society. success story we have, <coughs> the benefit is exponential. When he got in our network, somebody told him, you can't. But all we said was, you can't. You can't. You can't. Now, let me tell you the power of words. We always talk about the ghetto. We always talk about the inner city. We always talk about what's going on in these, these dysfunctional and chaotic places. Let me tell you tonight. Words can hurt, you know that. Words can damage, you know that. But if words can damage and hurt, words can heal, empower, inspire, motivate. I believe in you. You can do this. You're great. I have your back. I'm proud of you.
means everything. So when you leave at night and you talk to your daughter, you talk to your, your, your spouse, your partner, you talk to the people behind you, empower them, inspire them, motivate them. Right? How much does it cost? It's free. Understand that. And don't take things for granted. The older you get, you know, you lose people that you love. Mom, dad, I've been there. Right? And why you can tell them? Tell them you love. Tell them. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody get caught up in being bored. You need more sensitivity. Understand that. Uh, maybe you have stocks or something of different things that you have of value that may not necessarily be monetary in that moment. Um, liabilities, these are things that you're responsible for, something that you owe for. Balance, and this is the difference between your credit and your, your debits in your account. So essentially, what's your balance? You know, if you have a certain amount of money, you make a certain amount of expenses, the money left over is your current balance. That changes as you decide how much money is coming in, how much money you're putting out. In the equity, I'm talking about businesses, that's ownership you have in the company, right? How much equity do you own? Is everyone following so far? Yeah. Most people define failure as they try something and it didn't work out the way they thought it was gonna work out. I challenge you to rewrite in your mind how you see failure. Rewrite in your mind how you see failure. Failure is part of the process of success. And now I want you to redefine what success means to you. Because, uh, let me get Vaughn, Yaren, Yesenia. How much can you help me with these, uh, these cards? Everybody's going to get a uh, different card. Obrigado. Obrigado. Okay. Tell us what that means. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the Portuguese. Okay, sure. Let's uh, Vietnamese and Chao. Chao. Okay, Chao. Yes. Thank you. 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 If you're going to repeat after me how to say, uh, I got five dollars. If you're going to repeat after me how to say, uh, please in Tagalog. I got anybody want? Jordan, you want to try? Andrew, you want to try? Okay. Jordan, you want to try? All right. Okay, come on, stand up. This is please in Tagalog for five dollars. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Puri bang mapinu ang ninyo ako? <laughs> I ain't even trying. <laughs> Jordan, you want to try? Lisa James, you want to try? Do it one more time. Arthur. Nah, but you got to say it slow. Move. Do it one more time. I say it slow. All right, I'll say it slow. All right, I'll say it slow. Hey, repeat that. Okay, I'll say it slow. Pwede bang matulu an niyo ako? No. One more time, slow. Tari? Oh, that's Swahili mixed with it. <laughs> <laughs> but you tried, though. I'm going to give you that. <laughs> you tried. I'm gonna... Did you try? No, I need Okay, somebody tries. I want to give away this money. Francisco? Francisco? <laughs> Alright, here we go, Jack. Alright, here we go, Jack. Alright, here we go. Okay. Puri bang matulu ang niño ako. Puni kuni ba. Damn it. Never mind. Harris. Come on, Harris. Do you? Alright. How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. good, good. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as Dr. Lee said, my name is Keyshot. I go by Efe. Um. Yeah. Twelve boys, twelve truths, one race, one lie, and we ask them to share their stories, how the story is the truth of this nation. You see, long before our next proof, strong enough to hang from twelve foot trees, we knew who we were. 
We knew our problems. These boys got stories. These boys got problems. 10, 10 hour days and not one boy is blaming his hardship on a system like project housing, bus tokens, ticket luncheons, immigration, adoption, abortion, teen pregnancy, rape, police brutality, gang violence, like mass incarceration ain't the result of this system, but who are we to say he's lying? Who are y'all to say we're lying? All he knows is mother never loved him. Mother left him on the doorstep, so grasping for love, facing arm reminiscing about touch. All he knows is father never claimed him, father too was never claimed, so father never knew love, father never gave him love, he never knew trust, and we asked him to trust us. Our word is our bomb, you must be here tomorrow, cause 12 boys got 12 stories. And the root of this problem, whether it be the household or the system, is that nobody is listening. One boy doesn't know his last name, he's still hoping he gets adopted. Two boys in the midst of an argument, one calls his sister a bitch, she runs off the door. Some hours later, she comes home crying, rape. He keeps blaming himself. The other boy can't fathom with the fact that he didn't stop his younger sister from running out that door. Three boys think love is pain. I'm one of them. Four boys got the exact same story. Four boys got the exact same story. Five boys can't fathom with the fact that their mother is using their bodies to make ends meet. Six boys won't even talk. Their tears are telling their stories. Now the 12 boys, only one father got deported. I'm not talking about mine. Some fathers are in there, some fathers are in jail. And out of 12 boys, only one boy has never met his mother. Seven boys, your mother, she's strung out on drugs. And only one mother is on the strip to recover. I'm talking about mine. Eight boys want to be free. They're like, I can't go back to juvie. Nine boys, because of these 10, 10 hour days, want to go to college. 10 boys more confident than they ever been. 11 boys. Then their hardships on one decision deciding to be the same. 12 boys think it's a chance they can be different. One race. We blame it on the system, but we these 12 boys blame it on our households. We blame it on the leader of our household decisions. We like we never knew love, we never had love. All the system needs is love though. Like I wonder if he loved me, would he have still put the trigger? Cause if father knew love, father would be here. Mother would be here to a boys to a truce. One race, one lie. Both just needed love. Thank you. Like I was molested, right? And in order to block myself from the molestation, I would fight. This is something that I used every because I thought that I wasn't good enough to be with the group of guys that I was with. So me fighting more and being more violent was a way to me to solidify myself within the group, right? Everybody has their own thing. But now it's a different thing because when you open up about the stuff that you've been through, when you sit in these classes, somebody else been through. Somebody else been through, somebody else been through. And now it's a different education because now they can teach their kids on why they were like that. Me and my mother have a different, I had a, I don't like to say this, but I had a real hatred for my mother because I felt that she picked drugs over me, right? But now that I understand drugs, right? History, I understand that the drugs was put in my community. Right? And I understand the system of what was given to us, right? I have an empathetic understanding with my mother. To understand that some people, right, through their brain, and some people are more addictive than others, right? They can't stop it. They can't get over it like that. So I have an empathetic approach. So that's a different type of education. Two weeks ago, my wife and I were in our man cave watching TV. One o'clock in the morning, I look at my email on the computer. And I got accepted to Cal Poly Pomona. And how networking got me here, um, while in prison they had the Kairos pr prison ministry. A lot of you guys may know uh, about Kairos. And a guy sat across my table, this was in 2003. And a guy looked at me and said, hey, I know you. And I'm thinking, okay, this is an older white man. I said, well, you don't know me, I've never seen you before. So he came back the next day with a photocopy of a picture from his daughter's yearbook from 1991. And he says, I remember your face. That's how I knew you. His name was Marty Jr. And Marty happened to work with Dr. Reese. So as I was transferred from place to place, I went to CRC. While at CRC, Marty said, okay, hey, you need to be a part of uh, Project Rebound. They're coming to CRC. So I get ready, I go to the chapel, I'm there. No one's at the chapel. Turns out that it was on an S and Y yard. So therefore I missed out on the whole thing. So Marty made sure that I had his number. Now this was in 2011. So fast forward to, to 2017, 
right before I got ready to get out, I start seeing a lot about Project Rebound. Okay. So I called my wife and I said, hey, you know, I have a couple weeks before I, I come home. Can you call him for me? So uh, my wife got on the phone, she talked to him, and she, he told her, make sure he comes see me the day after he gets out. Because the day I got out, you know, we're gonna be with family. So the day after I got out, my wife and I drove to Cal Poly Pomona, and we sat in um, the little room that they have, the little cubicle, uh, the little trailer there, and he talked to us. And the first thing he told us was that we're gonna have to do this together, not apart, meaning it's gonna take all of us. So we went over to his office, um, he talked more about Project Rebound, and he told me, well, I want you to come to Pritzker because we're having um, the Reintegration Academy. Now, they had already been going on for, I think, five weeks. Okay, now this was like, now my third day out. So when I got here, I'm way behind everybody else. But the group accepted me as if I was still there from day one. And it put me up for area manager of Amazon. Uh, I do have information if you guys don't have jobs, if somebody needs jobs dealing with Amazon because we're opening up four buildings here in uh, San Bernardino County. And it's, it's there for you. The thing is you have to network, you know, and I'm thankful that that man sat across my table in 2003 because if, had, had he not sat across my table, I wouldn't have met Dr. Reese. Had he not handed me the phone number and said, hey, you need to be a part of Project Rebound, I wouldn't be here. A lot of us didn't know what we were doing the day that they opened their doors for us to come home. We we're like, oh, what am I going to do? But networking, it kept me going. I described your personality type. And I brought the personality type from fourth grade. Okay. All right. So no personality type is the best or better. Any questions about sensors? Perfect. We're moving on to intuition. Some characteristics to describe them: they're imaginative and verbally creative, oriented to future possibilities. They follow hunches or gut feelings. They like to see the big picture and then find out the facts. Once we're led by Moses, now we're just children of the wilderness, wandering the desert with old stories and no remembrance. It's easy to define race. Culture is where it gets complex. This is the story of America and why our sons have a complex. Equal because the law says, although lawmen treat us different, equal because the blood says, although skin shows us different. Education a great equalizer, the workforce proves that different. You can have a great melting pot and still have bias burning at the bottom of it. Popes, politicians, and principals preach the nature of land and law, but it doesn't equate to too much when we nurture our prejudices. Movement, we are most certainly expected to stand still. To 
to take a step forward can be catastrophic Unless it's docile, but when it's step is redefining When there's challenges, the margins of whiteness Bombs, large hands and the handcuffs Lies face into the hood of police cars, etc. Your body is no longer yours. Much like when bombs go off, limbs go everywhere. Except for the places they have to be for body to function. They are asking for the judge to give my guy 20 years, and I do not understand. And this is based on a true story. It's been a year, I never land a second interview. Labeled criminal, like crime is what I am. Got more time, had to show him what I am. When need be, my fist be diplomacy. Locked me in some hell, what was the change that you thought that it would bring to me? Product of my environment. In my mind, I escaped, books kept the iron bent. Outside, they assume beasts and question my intelligence. Provide their own answers to the questions that they pose to me. I'm feeling far side as jobs are passing me by. Wrote letters to my ex-girl just to pass time. They would never return. When they let me loose, they told me make sure you never return. Band with a brand no one wanted, but it's on my record. A record that nobody wants. Nobody buying stock in me. Going crazier than ever, although state pays for my therapy. They tell me keep my head up, chest out, like a soldier headed off the war. My war is on the streets. The streets were on my mind. My mind is like a cell, but I'm holding on to freedom. Um, I did 21, almost 22 years. When I first got out, Brown was my parole agent. And he used to talk to us about getting a career. Just don't get a job. He always used to say, get a career. Do something with your life that you can look back on. And I was telling him, this is the closest I have ever come to having a career. I never liked school. Never. I hated it. You know, but I ended up getting a GED while I was in prison. And now I'm looking forward to the window, not the door the windows that opened up when I started in here, everything just is out there for the taking, you know, in the right way, and I'm going for it. Because I didn't understand that word love until I came to this class. And now I have an understanding of how much arms reach. Thank you. Myself, 26 years incarcerated from the ages of 18 to senior in high school to 44 years old, I, I, I was released from prison with minimum uh, life skills. And being able to come to this academy, you know, has really uh, opened me up. It has given me the, the confidence to communicate the tools to communicate with individuals and, and with people. And it has helped me understand that even though I had a, a high bar for myself, that my bar should be even higher. But I'm thankful for, to Dr. Reese, I'm thankful to my parole agent, who I had just paroled to Pomona, I mean, transferred to Pomona not even a week. And he saw enough in me to give me an invitation to come and get interviewed. So I'm grateful for that. Ta'i, like I told you, boy, you got to infect your spirit. You come every week, you know, with that, that smile right there, you should be doing commercials or something. <laughs> you know, but I said, I, I just thank to be inducted into this here family. Thank you. In, in two months, it'll be two years since I've been home. And I did 29 years. And, uh, you know, it's Christmas and he saw something in me. And uh, he it talk, started talking to me about the program and um, wanted me to try. Because he knew I wanted a, a change in my career. And, um, you know, in, in the time that I spent in prison, I went to the pro board four times in 10 years and I got denied three times. It was only when I was genuine and real that they finally saw in me the, the, my true remorse and everything else that goes with it to, to let me go home. Um, when I interviewed with, with Dr. Reese, that interview sucked. It sucked. He knows it, I know it. He, he was, <laughs> no, he was putting me on the shelf with the guys that didn't make it. It was when I realized that I had to be, I, I turned around, I just gave a, a, a plastic interview. And when I finally turned around and I was real with him, and he saw what that parole board saw, he gave me, he goes, that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted to see in you. That's what this program is all about. Thank you for seeing what I had, I had put on, on my back show. You know, being genuine, being real. You know, I thank you for the opportunity and this has been 
probably a, a life-changing thing for me, you know? Not probably, it is. You know, thank you. I made it to graduation this Sunday, guys, because I gotta, I gotta be out of town for oh. something. So I just wanna let you guys know that I'm proud of each, of each and every one of you guys. So I just wanted to express myself and let you guys know that uh, we're proud of you guys and just keep keep on trucking. You got a, that's over 100 years of experience including myself in CDC parole. If you add all our years up, <laughs> and all of us come from the institution. Uh, I've worked this to 17 years, from the whole to the first uh, A2B dorm. If you're a true lifer, you know what A2B dorm is. Um, this is genuine, it's the best job to have because I'm from this, I'm from this. You know, I tell my peers that this is what I do. On the outside, when, when I'm away, I'm talking to kids, but I grew up in this. So I'm not, never gonna look down at you guys because things can change any day for any of us. But if you have the desire and the strength and the, and the horsepower, I'm gonna support you 100%. Man, look, it's a pleasure. Thank you for the kind words, but man, I'm not really good with pats on the back because I do it from my heart. Okay. All right. I just want to thank you, Dr. Reeves, and I want to thank this uh, amazing team you've put together, like the staff that you bring in and all the volunteers that come back. We can tell that they do it out of love. and. What I've discovered inside of this class is the answer to that old um, PBS special, Knowledge is Power, right? I thought I had um, seen parts of it before in my life, but until I was allowed to come inside of this classroom that you guys provided for us, I then grew an understanding of what it meant. Uh, I've never seen so many careers that I have personally been told, you screwed up, you can't go down that path no more. You screwed up, that's not yours no more. Uh, because of your ignorance, you've thrown that away. Inside this room, you debunked all those myths. And for that, I love you. I, I love what you have created here. The rest of the Claremont's for their justice education initiative um, and on behalf of the Claremont Colleges, I'd like to welcome you all to Pittsburgh. So welcome. pour out into us and let us know what was available to us. I just want to encourage all of us that came out of prison to stay focused, embrace your circumstances and your struggles, let them be what builds your character and give you strength. I'm totally grateful to you, Dr. Reese. It's not the things that he gave us, but it's the heart that he puts into this program. This really meant a lot to me. first day here. I believe it's an eight-week uh, program and I'm just confused. I don't, I don't know what to expect. I don't, don't know anything about it. So I'm just happy to be here to start.
Thank you.